Here's your opportunity to listen and learn from the most successful people driving growth and success in Palm Beach County and beyond. Welcome to the Business in Paradise Palm Beach podcast with Carrie Stamp, founder of Carrie Stamp and Company, Principled Wealth Advisors. Carrie and his guests share stories and insights from Palm Beach County's most successful executives, entrepreneurs, and community leaders. Learn how they made it to where they are today, what principles guide them, how they mentor others to achieve success, and more. Hi, this is Kerry Stamp, and you're listening to the Business in Paradise podcast. I've got a fantastic guest with us today. Uh, we have Joe Sterenka. Joe is the president of Sterenka Sports Strategy, and he is the former CEO of the PGA of America. And Joe is also a great golfer and good friend. So welcome to the Business in Paradise podcast, Joe. Carrie, uh, great to be with you. you. You've had some illustrious guests on, so uh, this is indeed an honor to join you on the podcast. Joe, thanks so much. So one of the things that we like to talk about on the podcast is the fact that we get to live in one of the most amazing places in the world. I chose to live here. I moved here in 2006. Sharon and I had been at a meeting at the Breakers in 2002. We looked around. We said, oh, my God. We're going back to Chicago. It's November. And guess what we have to look forward to for the next five months? Tell us your story. How did you get to Palm Beach County? Uh, very similar. Uh, we came down to interview with the PJ of America for a job as their director of communications back in 1988 and brought my wife and our daughter, Alexandra, who was a year old at the time. And Went uh, to PGA National, watched the Senior PGA Championship, which was in February back then. You know, Jack Nicklaus, Arnold Palmer, and Gary Player. And boy, you know, February, the sun was out, 72 degrees, some light trade winds, palm trees swaying. And then we went back to Washington, D.C. and uh, sleet and cold and rain. And, and Joanne said, you know, I... I think I could get used to that uh, all winter long. So, and there's a reason, you know, that our population here in Florida is now over over 21 million and keeps growing. It's a tax advantage state, uh, but heck, uh, you know, you get to that stage in in life and you can choose where you want to work. And um, as this pandemic has proven, we can work pretty much anywhere. You know, give us some some high speed internet and and we can zoom or uh, WebEx or, you know, Microsoft Teams. And, uh, you know, so, yeah, we were fortunate to be one of those uh, folks in our late 20s who came down and never looked back. And it, it sure probably was not a very tough sale, Sharon. Uh, it was not tough to sell her on moving down here. And I'm sure Joanne has been thrilled with the move. Go take me back for a second. So you're living in the D.C. area. Uh, you've gotten out of college, and I think that you were, were a mountaineer. Is that right? He got recruited to uh, play baseball uh, by Dale Ramsberg, the coach at the West Virginia University Mountaineers. And, you know, I was a, a good high school player and we won some championships and did okay. But, uh, you know, then seeing a, a real slider for the first time and finding out that everybody was an A-lister on, uh, in, uh, on that baseball team, I said, you know, I think I was a uh, had a good high school career. Uh, I'm going to focus on on uh, my academics and having a good time at West Virginia. So you get out of college. Do you immediately head to the D.C. area? Is that uh, where you had your first job? I did. Um, you know, I'm uh, the oldest of five from a middle class Navy family. Uh, you know, so I had a chance to graduate in three years. So I finish up, uh, get my undergraduate at age 20 and take a job working for the Washington Bullets selling season tickets, you know, uh, during the playoffs and getting a 10% commission. I'll never forget, uh, you know, a friend of mine saying, oh, you know, why'd you take that job? You can't make any money. And I'd already sold a bunch of season tickets. And, and that's when I found out that sales was not something magical it was knowing your product and being enthusiastic about it and uh, I was a jock you know I, I loved and I was a voracious reader and so I loved to listen to the stories and read about the bullets and then I'd stand up with a suit on behind a draped table and tell stories and uh, made more money in six weeks of the playoffs you know than 
I had my whole life. And, you know, it was fortunate that that was the year that Dick Mata coined um, the phrase, it's not over till the fat lady sings and bullets came back from three to one deficits twice. So people were pretty hepped up, so to speak, and uh, buying season tickets. Yeah, I think that phrase might have uh, originated maybe a little bit earlier in the opera world, but its applicability to basketball, yeah, <laughs> maybe in the 80s. Hey, uh, Joe, you also eventually went to work for a guy that uh, another one of my guests worked for uh, at ProServe. Uh, tell us about that experience, because if I recall correctly, uh, the work that you did at ProServe was one of the with one of the biggest names in, in sports history. Yeah, it, it uh, was fun watching the last dance recently. I, you know, remember being in my office in ProServe in 1984, the, you know, a few months before the Olympics in Los Angeles and, and walks this sharp looking, you know, six foot six guy and big, great smile. And it's Michael Jordan. And, it congratulated him on winning the championship with that uh, clutch shot to finish it up. And he was going to become a, a client of ProServes and showed him some of the marketing materials we had done with other folks. I said, but, you know, you seem to have a, a flair uh, of your own, so it'll be unique to you. And uh, so it was fun to be part of the creation of Air Jordan with David Falk and, and uh, the folks at Nike. But yeah, I, you know, I I like to say, Kerry, I, I've never worked a day in my life. I got out of college, went to work for the Washington Bullets, went from there to work for the Cleveland uh, Cavaliers for a couple of seasons, and then came back to D.C. Uh, to work at ProServe and ended up coming to the PGA in 88, spent 25 years there. So now I'm uh, still you know, working in golf, but at a much more uh, leisurely pace, so I don't have to travel that 180 days a year I did uh, as a chief exec for the PGA. And and we're going to uh, spend a lot of time talking about the PGA experience, but before we get there, for our listeners that are not familiar with ProServe, tell us a little bit about that organization and the impact that they had on sports marketing. Yeah, in 1968, it was the first open tennis tournament, meaning professionals could play with amateurs uh, for the national championship that was administered by the United States Tennis Association. And so there's this Davis Cup tennis captain, Donald Dell, and uh, he, you know, had befriended Arthur Rash and Stan Smith, and they're thinking about turning pro now that there's going to be some money. And Arthur went to Donald and, and said, Donald, you have any ideas? How do I go about becoming a professional and getting an agent. And Donald said, well, you know, there's this guy in Ohio, Mark, he's speaking about Mark McCormick, uh, who's done some things with some professional golfers. So, you know, may, and Arthur looked at him, shake, sh shook his head and said, Donald, I want you to be my agent. Um, and he said, oh, oh, okay. So pretty much there, ProServe was born with Arthur Ashe and Stan Smith. Uh, similar to what McCormick did with the big three in golf. And, you know, I'm proud that, you know, we went toe to toe with IMG, you know, the largest uh, sports marketing agency in the world now owned by Endeavor. And, and we won about two out of three every head to head pitches, uh, you know, whether it was a sports marketing assignment to negotiate television rights for a tournament or, you know, get sponsorship for another tennis tournament or sell endorsements for, you know, a, a, a group of, of athletes. ProServe was, uh, you know, had a point of differentiation and we had a really good communications and marketing department, which is what I had the opportunity to do. And so, you know, ProServe uh, ended up, you know, having, you know, not just Michael Jordan, but, you know, Jimmy Connors, Patrick Ewing, Flo Jo, um, you know, James Worthy, uh, the list goes on and on, uh, you know, tons of uh, Hall of Famers and so many sports. Uh, but we started a golf division. Um, uh, we had a, a young promoter manager named Bob Morris, who had convinced Raymond and Maria Floyd to leave IMG and, and come be a client to ProServes. And the next thing you know, we had Payne Stewart and Donnie Hammond and Scott Perplank, Kathy Whitworth, Hollis Stacy, Jim Thorpe, uh, you know, again, you know, some 
some of the great uh, names in in uh, golf. And that's what inter- introduced me to the PGA. They saw this young upstart company that seemed to be doing things a little bit differently on the marketing side and wanted to ha- have a conversation about how we went about that. And the rest is history, so to speak. Expound a little bit on your uh, relationship that you had marketing uh, with Michael Jordan and the Air Jordans. How, how did that develop and how did that play out uh, in your career? Well, really, you start with um, one of the most gifted people, uh, you know, certainly athletically, but James and Dolores Jordan did an amazing job raising this young man. Um, he had a great, uh, you know, uh, group of siblings that supported him. So he's just a terrific guy. Um, and But he was an all-world competitor, and you saw that played out in, in over several weeks of, of the story of The Last Dance. So when you take, you know, raw talent like that, it, it starts with a brand. And so the Air Jordan brand, that really was, you know, Nike's creations. Uh, but that kind of set the table for a whole host of related marketing activities and how you tell the story because everything you know was sky high everything he was flying in first class he was you know flying above everybody else Um, and you could use all the metaphors you want but you know when you got him one-on-one we i remember uh arranging a 60 minutes interview uh and we've got this producer bill brown who's a former fbi agent and he's a he's he's a tough cookie you know he he didn't have a lot of soft spots and didn't know sports or basketball so i think he kind of poked around you know trying to see if if there was something that couldn't be right with this this kid and uh, and i said to dinner with um or with diane sawyer who was the correspondent and bill one night and I said, uh, you know, I've looked myself because you want to be able to you know, be truthful and tell him the story, but he just seems too good to be true. It, he, he's that good. And they, they kind of morphed that line into he's like Tinkerbell, you know, who's almost imaginary, perfect creature. So, uh, yeah, you know, to see, um, you know, the Air Jordan and then the way he played and then us being able to, position him not just with you know some of the the media you you kind of crave to get any attention at all but to go after 60 minutes and usa today and prominent places people magazine and, and the like and and everything that he was associated with was the very best and deservedly so and your job was to manage the message and manage the communication strategy that the agency had as they represented michael yeah now Keep in mind, Nike's got a pretty sophisticated communication shop, and Wyden and Kennedy win awards for all the commercials that they do. So a lot of ours was, you know, the only way to get to Michael, you know, for anything unrelated to basketball. You know, that you were going to go to the, Brian McIntyre was the head of communications for the Chicago Bulls, but for anything else, you were going to come to his manager, and and that's when we got involved. And you know, for example, we had the booking agent for. David Letterman, who's desperate to have Jordan on, he had just torched the Knicks for 62 in the garden or something like that. And and so he said, well, you know, he can do it, but you have to promote Nike be- shoes and Wilson basketballs um, and General Motors cars. I mean, those are his three big endorsements. And and if he's going to come on the show, that's that's part of the rule. You got to got to promote those things. And and then he'll make time to do it. And, you know, that's the behind the scenes of the horse trading that goes on to make some of these, uh, you know, A-listers uh, available for, for interviews. And so they said, well, we, we're not bringing a car in the studio. Uh, but, yeah, you bring us the Air Jordans, bring us a Wilson basketball. And, and Letterman, as only Letterman can do, you know, had some fun with it. He, he, uh, he talked about, you know, wh- wh- what exactly do you do for Wilson to – to, you're a, a national advisor. They pay you fifty thousand dollars to advise them on basketballs, and he says, "Well, you know, for what we do is, you know, we have big regulation basketball for big hands and a small basketball for small hands, and 
Letterman laughs and says, that's $50,000. Wow, that's that's fantastic, Michael. And, but, t- you know, it's the shoe that fascinates me. You got this new Air Jordan shoe, and I hear it was banned by the NBA. And and uh, it would, tell, tell me why the NBA would ban your shoe. And Michael said, well, you know, our team colors are black and, and red and white, and this shoe is just black and red. And Letterman says, so you mean to tell me that the NBA banned this shoe because it doesn't have the color white in it. And Michael said, that's right. Doesn't, doesn't meet the colors. And he, Letterman says, well, neither does the NBA and throws the laughing, throws the shoe over his shoulder, breaks the imaginary pane of glass that he's broken for uh, thousands of other things. So, so we got the plug for the sponsors and Letterman got his pound of flesh by making fun of it. But, uh, uh, at, that was our job is is to promote his association with some of the leading brands and and michael was a good sport all along he, you know he could he could take a joke and he could deliver uh one pretty well as uh, at the same so you're about 30 years old you're going to leave the dc area am i do i have the uh timing right yeah 29 29 came, came down here at age 29 and said you know florida 29 boy i you know i was a hot shot going back and forth between New York and, and Washington, D.C., and felt that was the center of the universe. And Florida, yeah, maybe I'd go to Florida when I'm 50. And shoot, now I'm 62, and I'm, I'm one of the young people. So uh, I'm, I'm glad we came when we came, and it was a beautiful place to you know raise Alexandra, and we had our son, Stephen. Uh, they went to St. Clair School and Cardinal Newman, and uh, we still have lifelong friends from the area. So you you come down to work for the PGA of America in the communications department, and that job lasts for how long? How long are you working communications in the PGA, and what was the progression from that start to eventually running the entire operation? You know, I felt that um, golf at the time in the late 80s was was not as advanced from a sports marketing standpoint as tennis. Um, tennis just seemed to have, uh, you know, 12 or 13, you know, sponsor activation ideas going on at any, any tournament. And golf had the pro-am, um, which was very powerful. But beyond that, there, there wasn't a lot uh, other than uh, the telecast itself. And so I felt, you know, the PGA also had, two events the pga championship was was seen as not you know had a tenuous grip as the fourth major and some folks were trying to make the players championship the fourth major and nudge the pga out and the Ryder cup you know I'll tell a, a famous story about a about that later but you know the Ryder cup wasn't that well known and you know, i felt that if we could uh, bring in a great salesperson and I could do the marketing um, that we could really build the PGA brand and monetize it and raise some money to put in the education and youth golf initiatives and so many other things that help the game of golf grow and help golf professionals do their job to, to make golf a better game for millions of Americans. And so we hired a guy from Anheuser-Busch, another guy from, you know, St. Louis had done some work down there and, and put together a, a rocking team. And so went from communications to marketing and business development and pretty much all the new things. Um, I didn't invent the internet uh, as Al Gore did, but I was there at the start of um, the internet and, and, one of the great stories was, uh, you know, paying the potato growers of Alberta, Canada, 35,000 Canadian, you know, for uh, the PGA.com URL. So that was back in geez, 1998 or something like that. And, you know, it really revolutionized how associations conducted their B2B business of serving their members and communicating with them and capturing data. And set the stage for some amazing B two C, you know, business to consumer content ideas. Uh, one of which won a sports semi for interactive media around the PGA Championship. But yeah, so you know, all the new business development. My 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 turning point was working on the the uh, strategic plan for the 
PGA in, in 2001. We had hired Booz Allen Hamilton to come in and help us with a strategic plan in the late 80s. And, you know, had pretty much gone through and ticked all the boxes to complete that plan and um, needed another one. And so I put together the, you know, the um, creative plan to present these ideas and, and, and worked with the senior management team, our CEO, my, my predecessor was Jim Autry, um, to, in the course of uh, 10 uh, magazine covers set in the year, you know, 2011, was going to say, hey, 10 years from now, with this strategic plan, this is what they're going to be saying about PGA members being, you know, the real leaders of their community, um, that uh, the PGA championship is going to be the most watched uh, event of the year, you know, that the Ryder Cup matches is going to be take a place as the Olympics of golf. And, you know, there were so many things like that, that tied me not just to the business of the association, but the grassroots members, because that, that's what differentiates the PGA. You can have events that come and the go and go, but to have 28,000 people out there that are ambassadors for the brand of golf and introducing our sons and daughters and getting us excited and our, our spouses excited about playing, that's the, the most important group to serve. And Joe, let's clarify that just a little bit, because I think most people know that the PGA of America sponsors the PGA golf tournament or the PGA championship, many people probably also know that the PGA uh, from the American side runs the Ryder Cup. And uh, but a lot of people don't know what the difference is of the PGA versus the PGA Tour, where the professional golfers are playing. So what what's the difference? And how did that come about? Well, yeah, the PGA Tour runs weekend week out golf they run the world golf championships they run the fedex playoffs but golf is unique in that the major championships augusta national um, hosts the masters every year the united states golf association conducts the u.s open the royal and ancient you know sponsors the the open championship as they say or the british open and the pga of america is the pga championship so those four majors sit outside of the pga tour and all, you know, run by organizations that have a great uh, set of assets to contribute to golf, but do it in much different and complementary ways. What happened with the PGA of America and the PGA Tour is they were one organization up until 1968. But in 1958, you know, the first PGA Championship was televised. The the majors were starting to get televised, the Masters and the U.S. Open um, this young kid from Western Pennsylvania named Arnold Palmer came along and, you know, golf got to be popular with, and all of a sudden television companies were paying um, the PGA for the rights to broadcast the event. Well, they never had that revenue before, you know, the, all the revenue came from local sponsors and, and the pro-am and, and ticket sales. And so this was, you know, found money and, so an association like the PGA, where you had Arnold, Jack, and Gary managed by, remember that guy, Mark McCormick, uh, whose job it was to make them as much money as possible. And on the other side, you'd have, uh, you know, the Harvey Penix and, you know, the those uh, uh, Max Elbins from Con Burning Tree. And, uh, you know, down here, you had uh, Leo Frazier. And those were teaching professionals they they might qualify to play in a pga championship or a u.s open but they made their living running the operation of of a golf club uh, teaching lessons and selling merchandise and running junior programs and you know being a rules official and uh you know for the member guest tournament and those uh different uh, viewpoints on being a golf professional meant they had different priorities for where that money should go. So now you got this television money and the tour pros and McCormick, they want, you know, the money to go into purses and the club pros wanted to go into education and growth of the game initiatives. And after 10 years of, you know, battling over money, they just said, why don't you, you know, 
we just figure out a way where the PGA Tour could take the 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 name and the logo and and create its own division. The the it was the tournament players division or tournament players bureau at that time that was part of the PGA and they went out on their own and they did pretty well with 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 the the logo so uh, and name. So if they're were a licensee of the PGA name, you know, they, they've been a very successful one. And certainly they're 10 times the size of the PGA uh, today financially and have great economic uh, and media clout. But the best thing is that, you know, they work hand in glove with the PGA and Jay Monahan and Seth Waugh, you know, work closely together. And, and with, again, dealing with the impact of a global health pandemic, uh, that cooperation is more important than ever. So, Joe, as you were working through your career at the PGA of America, you kind of rise up the ladder. And at some point, you're working on the strategic plan. And, you know, nobody gets to the top without some you know, hard work, some initiative, and maybe even a little political lobbying and having somebody on your side along the way. Are there some folks that you would say that these were incredible mentors to me as you were going through that process? And what was it like to actually apply for that job and have them give it to you? How far in advance do you think you knew about that? Well, you, th- this was a, a remarkable journey. And I first, you know, met Jim Autry at the PGA Merchandise Show uh, in 1988 up in Orlando, Florida, and, and the chairman of um, the advisory committee was the former chairman of Benton and Bowles Advertising, and he'd saw, seen them through their merger with Darcy. And so he was the top business person on the board, and Jim was the CEO and a golf professional and golf coach himself. And we sat up in a suite in the Peabody Hotel and dreamed big dreams of, you know, things that could happen. So, and they all came true. You know, they were built into that strategic plan that Booz Allen wrote for us. And so Jim and Vic were incredibly uh, important to me. We had a a chief operating officer named Paul Bogan who came from IBM and, and he was a master at coaching people and he coached everybody different you know so if you had talent he was going to coach you tougher than you know folks who might not have have as much enterprise and uh, and I had a tough time you know committing to a decision you know that I could it was one of my strengths that I could see both sides and so I wouldn't get locked into a decision and be able to facilitate a discussion. But as you move up and become a leader you got to be a little more decisive at some point Somebody's going to say, okay, what's the call going to be? What are we going to do and why? And uh, Paul taught me how to make a decision. I, you know, I had a few times in his office, I'd go in there and I'd be set. I'm ready to make a decision. And he talked me out of it. I'd walk out going, I think that we're going to do the opposite now. And then the next you know, day I'd go down there and he'd talk me back in as my original position. I said, never again. <laughs> I'm going to know more about you know, what I'm presenting um, than anybody in the room. I'm going to be the expert. So if somebody wants to try to flip me, they they can try all they want. But if I really know my facts in the background and, you know, have talked to enough people, I'm not going to change, you know, my uh, position. And I'll be decisive. I may not be right all the time. The, the, let's not confuse decisiveness with uh, uh, omnipotence. And, you know, but you know, that's what people are looking for in leaders. And, and I get, got a chance to uh, uh, learn those life lessons from those gentlemen. Also had a wonderful man um, who was a baseball player himself. Um, he was part of uh, Ronald Reagan's kitchen cabinet, John Yockham from Western New York. Uh, I had played and uh, we won some championships in Western New York when I was going to high school my junior and senior year and he was from Jamestown and so he was you know one of the smartest most gentle you know men that I've ever met and uh, learned a lot from him you know going back to ProServe David Falk who was Michael Jordan's agent impressed me with how he memorized the uh, salaries and the signing bonuses for the entire first round of the draft and going back 10 years and that he could negotiate with a 
general manager and net present value, the offer that they were making based on, you know, previous uh, centers or shooting guards um, that had been drafted number eight in the number eight position. It was just extraordinary how, what a command of facts he had. And and I took that with me to the PGA too. And it was part of, of how we began to articulate the economic impact of golf in America and golf at the state level and golf at the county level. So yeah, you know, uh, and then Donald Dell, his his uh, great saying was, little things mean a lot. And he, he would oftentimes just drop a personal note to somebody, might be a client, might be a sponsor, might be somebody in the media, might be me. And he, it was for no reason. It wasn't my birthday or, you know, and he just wanted that person to know that he was thinking about him. And it was amazing how powerful that was. You'd literally do anything for Donald Dell because he, he cared about you. So, yeah, and I, I've written a lot of those notes in, in my career. That's fantastic. Great advice. So aside from that personal touch that you just described, if you were talking to a young person that wanted to get into the sports marketing business right now, what are some other things that you would tell them to be thinking about and how they should train themselves or prepare themselves for what's become an incredibly competitive, although uh, very rewarding business? Number one, it's a great time. You know, that golf, tennis, the Olympic sports, uh, as well as the team sports are all undergoing a metamorphosis um, because of different types of media and methods of distribution of that content. So a game telecast is just one idea, but, you know, a blog or a podcast, a video uh, blog on uh, on LeBron James's manager um, was talking about how uh, many viewers were watching his workouts and following his nutrition plan. All of that is content. Young people understand that. They get that. They 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 look at at YouTube and and follow people from all over the world to, providing different points of view. And I, so I think we're always going to have you know the game coverage, but it's the ancillary content that is going to build brands and and create a broader audience with that's stickier, so to speak, or you know, higher degree of engagement. Uh, sports gaming, you know, that Supreme Court decision that allowed states to um, allow sports betting and the fact that proposition bets, you know, the in-game bets are where most of the, you know, the sports gaming takes place. That's just starting. So it's the DraftKings of the world, so to speak. You know, DraftKings just went public. That really going to add a new dimension. Think about fantasy, but then put, you know, you could have a hundred one uh, dollar wagers on different things. Who's going to be closest to the green on number twelve at, at, at Augusta, or uh, who's going to you know make the winning putt at the PGA Championship or the Ryder Cup? So those are things that are new, and there's n not a lot of precedent for it, which suggests it's a ripe opportunity for young people coming in. Just maybe three things in terms of advice. Number one, all this digital uh, content um, that we talked about for sports. Well, you got a lot of digital content of your own in your social media network. So you need to curate and archive some of that and make sure it fits your brand. So whether it's Carrie Stamp or Joe Steranka, we have a brand and what we stand for. And we, to make that brand appealing to a, f a future employer, we need to go look through our own digital um, footprint and, and make sure that we don't have anything that uh, maybe contradicts that brand. Um, the second is be prepared. You know, so many times you get that opportunity to, to meet the head of a company, the owner of a business, uh, the chief marketing officer. Uh, and it shouldn't be, you know, them having to ask you questions. Go in loaded for bear. I mean, you know, do the, you can certainly look uh, at everything that uh, about their career that's on, on LinkedIn and search about the company, search about its competitors. 
but that's what always um, got me ahead is I had a lot of questions about their business and, you know, every, I'd ask politely if I could present an idea because you didn't want to be so bold. You think, you know, how much do, does this young kid know coming in? And the final, you know, thing is that the follow-up is, is so important and, you know, just a thank you note. Eh, that's okay. But, you know, maybe it's something on butterflies and they're they're going on a butterfly trip with their wife uh, that somebody had mentioned and finding something that relates to butterflies and put that in the thank you note though go back to what donald dell said those little things mean a lot so you want to do try to do everything to differentiate yourself um, in a positive way uh, as you go after those jobs so you know, make sure your your story is is clean and good and matches your brand. Go be prepared and then, you know, follow up with a very special touch. And eight out of 10 times, you'll get a job. Joe, you had a great run uh, rising to the top of the golf world. Are there a couple of experiences that you had along the way that uh, kind of stand out that you say, you know, geez, these are these are things I will never forget. Yeah. Well, I'll start with the uh, the PGA Championship at Valhalla in 2000. Um, again, you know, one of those ideas was that the PGA Championship was going to be the most watched event. And you know, we were taking some heat from some of the writers about choosing Valhalla for the millennial PGA Championship. That they said, wow, it's year 2000 and the PGA is that, or the Masters is at Augusta and the U.S. Opens at Pebble, Open Championships at St. Andrews, and the PGA is at Valhalla. Uh, and they, you know, one writer who's a good friend, he said, did you just make a mistake? You know, you have Medina in 99. Did you, shouldn't you have done Valhalla in 99 and Medina in 2000, classic course? And it's my job to promote the PGA. So I said, well someone has to identify the next, you know, group of, of major championship sites. And so what better year to do it than the millennial? Well, that was the year we started a three hole playoff and this uh, kid from Southern California, Bob May goes toe to toe with Tiger Woods, the, you know, Wood shoots 67 and May shoots 66 in the final round. And they go in a three hole playoff that comes down the last hole. Um, you know, before Tiger wins. And that's a uh, a 17 rating that the last hour got. And the executives at CBS Sports were always battling with the folks from entertainment about get off the air, get off the air at six o'clock. You know, we don't want golf running over. You're going to get this little four rating and we got, you know, 60 minutes and Survivor that are going to get ratings that are going to be a 12 to a 17. Survivor was a new reality tv uh, that was new back in 2000 um it was getting a 17 rating and so we uh, went into 60 minutes with a 17 rating and the entertainment uh, and news folks they never complained again about golf so that was one uh, and then uh, you know the the whole um specter around 9 11 and postponing the Ryder cup and that was something i'll never forget you know we're working over the weekend and have Carl Rove who's calling Jim Autry and delivering messages from President Bush about, you know, major events. We need to make sure that, you know, we don't let terrorists, you know, get us down. And, and, uh, but we made the decision to postpone the Ryder Cup for all the right reasons. And, and then, uh, you know, just to see uh, the PGA membership grow and prosper and, you know, you look at the impact that pros have at clubs like the ones that we play at, uh, but heck, you know, uh, down at Okahili Golf Club, a municipal course where all of our kids learn how to play junior golf and thousands of other kids in, in Palm Beach County learn. You know, there's PGA members that are just making golf a better game and helping us enjoy it. And working with them was, you know, the 
the greatest honor of all. Yeah, the celebrities I'd work I've been fortunate to work with celebrities my whole career and I try never to get caught up in the celebrities. It's it's more the real people that buy the tickets and watch the you know sh- the the TV events on TV that drive the ratings that pay all the bills. So you can focus on the the uh, the average sports fan. I think you're going to do okay. Those celebrities they're the, the they're pretty good at, uh, they have good managers and agents to monetize it for them. Yeah. Joe, it, it, it was an absolutely amazing career that you've had in the sports industry. But I know that you're not done, even though that you retired from uh, the PGA of America a few years ago. You're still at it. What are you doing now? Well, um, locally, you know, I've had the chance to uh, be on the Honda Classic board uh, ever since you know, it left Marisol and, and uh, Nicholas Children's Healthcare Foundation got involved. Uh, so, it, you know, helping Jack and Barbara with anything is is an honor. And I had a chance to work with them at the PGA, so to be able to continue that. And to work with my old friend, uh, Ken Kennerly, from our ProServe days, back when he was uh, one of the young guns in the golf division. And we both came down to South Florida around the same time. So, you know, the 30 plus years now can't believe it or not and then you know buffalo dot agency is um, the leading sports marketing communications uh, shop in the golf industry so we've got dozens of clients and you know the people side and the annika soren stams and the usga uh, the product side we've worked with Bridgestone and Lampkin and and uh, Echo Shoes and and then the places side you know PJ National Casa de Campo Kohler you know, are all clients so and we do extraordinary storytelling and and uh, digital content so you know you need to have the old creative approach to telling a story but what you can do with content now and shooting it and capturing it this podcast is. An example of that is just extraordinary. So have a, a way to continue to contribute to golf uh, here locally and on the national and international stage and, and to do some good. You know, I think that's the, the biggest thing that I've learned, whether it was helping Dan Rooney start the Folds of Honor Foundation or the uh, West Virginia University College of Media working on their strategic plan and uh, midnight golf up in Detroit, you know, you know, so many um, great charitable organizations and, and they take people uh, and some money, but more, more importantly, they take uh, people. Joe, you have a lovely wife, Joanne. And for those of us that know her, she is uh, certainly someone that has a very vivacious personality. And I'm sure that uh, she's been a great mother. Do we have any grandkids yet, Joe? We do. We have a a uh, four-and-a-half-year-old granddaughter, Tatum, um, who's up in Brooklyn, New York. And uh, uh, she is just a joy. Uh, You know, you think you've accomplished all the the great things in life and done things that are all-time cool and fun, and but then a grandchild comes along and you go, oh, okay, I did not know that that was going to be that special. And, uh, so, yeah, she's the light of our, our life and pretty much can get Grandpa to do anything. Makes it all worthwhile. Hey, I want to put you on the spot for just a second. I'm sure you've played, which I, one of my bucket list things has always been to play Augusta National. I'm sure you've played Augusta National probably more times than I could even fathom playing Augusta National. But do you have a couple of favorite golf courses that you say, geez, I really love these places. They're incredibly special. Yeah, I... I am a fan of um, feeling ocean breezes and hearing the the water and birds and chirping and you know just the the those uh, fescue grasses you know blowing in the wind uh, you know, make a a golf course panorama look like you know living artwork. So those are you know my favorites but uh, so that cypress point royal county down pacific dunes in terms of parkland courses i love valhalla i love uh, um, southern hills you know great track uh, there uh, here in the area i'll put up you know the the hills course at jupiter hills against any any course in the country so yeah, it's I, I have played Augusta National three times. Not 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 that many, but three is 
plenty. Um, and uh, it is one of those places where, you know, whether you're a PGA Tour player going to play or the amateur women who are now playing in the that Augusta National Am- Amateur Championship and or the kids and their parents going in for drive, chip, and putt or a, a, a guest like me uh, coming in, they strive to make it the greatest day of your life and they succeed. <laughs> it's a special place. I'm sure they do. This, this has been a great conversation with uh, Joe Starenka. The Business in Paradise podcast is focused on listening to the stories of people that have been leading business leaders in Palm Beach County. And Joe, you're certainly one of those people. The golf industry is incredibly important to Palm Beach County. It's probably one of our biggest industries and the thing that we, I would imagine, are most known for. So I cannot thank you enough for sharing your thoughts, your insights, and a little bit of your life story in the podcast today. Joe Starenka, thank you for being with us. Carrie, it's been a pleasure. Thank you. Thank you for listening to the Business in Paradise Palm Beach podcast with Carrie Stamp, founder of Carrie Stamp and Company, Principal Wealth Advisors. Click the subscribe button below to be notified when new episodes become available. The information covered and posted represents the views and opinions of the guests and does not necessarily represent the views or opinions of the Commonwealth Financial Network. The content has been made available for informational and educational purposes only. The content is not intended to be a substitute for professional investing advice. Always seek the advice of your financial advisor or other qualified financial service provider with any questions you may have regarding your investment planning. Carrie Stamp and Company is located at 110 Bridge Road to Cuesta, Florida, 33469. Securities and advisory services offered through Commonwealth Financial Network member FINRA SIPC, a registered investment advisor. Thank you.